today we have with us Carrie Upeet. She is with, um, she's the sea turtle recovery coordinator at the NOAA Fisheries GARFO office. Carrie's going to present an overview of its upcoming outreach process to develop bycatch reduction measures to reduce takes of sea turtles in Atlantic coastal trawl fisheries. Just as a rem, uh, reminder, this is um, the, the work that Mike Pitney gave us a heads up on at the policy board meeting at our meeting in October. Um, there is a a short three-pager on some of the information that Carrie is going to provide us today in the meeting materials, as well as I think Carrie's going to tell us about some webinars that Noah will be hosting, and those will be on the commission's calendar um, for your reference. Um, so Carrie, uh, take it away. Great, thank you. That was a great overview um, to get us started. And are you able to present the presentation. Um, Maya, if you could just pull okay, that perfect. up. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, thank you for um, giving me some time on the agenda to talk about turtles um, with you. And I guess for just before we start, um, I did give a similar presentation at the New England and Mid-Atlantic Council meetings in December. So if anybody was at those meetings, this will be um, a refresher of that as well. So without further ado, we can go ahead and get started to the next slide. Thank you. So I want to start by why are we here talking about turtles today? Um, so very quickly, um, all turtles are either endangered or threatened under the Endangered Species Act, and fishery bycatch is the largest threat to turtles, um, both in our area as well as range-wide. Um, so as a result, we've been doing um, bycatch reduction research um, in trials for about 20 years now. And we are at the point right now to share those current results with you and let you know um, of other research we have planned as well as um, some of our potential management measures we are considering. But I did wanna stress that we are not at the proposed rule stage yet. Um, we really do want to hear from you and, and get some input on these measures as well as um, some information. So quickly today, I'm going to um, briefly go over some turtle biology and bycatch details and then spend the most of the time talking about the research conducted to date by target species and then also finish up why, um, with what kind of information is needed as we move forward and then um, identify some ways you can um, chime in. So next slide, please. So obviously, um, turtles are sea turtles are reptiles, so they are temperature dependent. Um, I wanted to note, just in general, um, turtles move up the Atlantic coast from their southern wintering areas as the water temperatures warm in the spring, and then this trend is reversed in the fall as the water temperatures cool. Um, we typically find sea turtles in waters north of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, from May through November. So I put this map up here really just to show you that. Um, sea turtles are not found in all areas north of North Carolina at all times of the year. Um, so when the time comes for any potential management, we would be looking into implementing those bycatch reduction measures in the areas and times where turtles co-occur with fisheries. So next slide, please. And why are we even concerned about turtles? Well, I mentioned um, they're all listed underneath the Endangered Species Act. Um, I think it's important to note that no sea turtle species has recovered to the point where um, delisting is warranted. Um, under the ESA, um, all take is prohibited with certain exceptions, and we have to enact measures to promote recovery. Um, every um, turtle recovery plan has reducing mortalities from fishery bycatch as a priority. And I have noted the one that's specific to the loggerhead recovery plan here because it does identify um, implementing these TED requirements in trawl fisheries um, north of Cape Hatteras. Also, it's important to recognize that turtles are considered fish underneath the Magnuson-Stevens Act, and then the provisions related to that bycatch apply here too. So under National Standard 9, which I know you're all familiar with, um, but it does require that bycatch be minimized, and if unavoidable, the mortality minimized. So we really are operating under both of these mandates when we're looking at reducing turtle mortality in trawl fisheries. So next slide, please. So in terms of some of the numbers, um, I put the latest trawl bycatch estimate done by our Northeast Fishery Science Center on the screen here. 
Um, this bycatch estimate takes into consideration observed takes in the fishery as, as well as effort in the fisheries based upon vessel trip reports. Um, you can see in the on the second bullet, um, we have a little bit over uh, 570 loggerheads in this time frame total um, with a smaller number of the other species. Um, this is the first time a trawl bycatch estimate has been done for loggerheads. And it also is the first time we have a bycatch estimate for George's Bank. I also wanted to flag that these bycatch rates were stratified by latitude, season, and depth. Um, so, for example, the highest loggerhead interaction rate occurred in waters south of 37 north latitude from November through June, and that was in waters deeper than 50 meters. Um, however, the greatest number of estimated turtle interactions occurred in the mid-Atlantic region north of 39 north latitude in the warmer months in waters less than 50 meters deep. And this is because there is a greater amount of commercial fishing effort in this area compared to those further south. Um, if you look at um, the fishing gear mortality rates, those are determined from a review of observed cases and injuries. And then the latest um, turtle mortality rate for trawls is 43%. However, if tows are sufficiently short, um, survival in those trawls can be high. And if you move down the screen, um, if you look at just the observed interactions in trawl gear, you can see the numbers in the bottom graph. So I want to stress this is not corrected for observed effort like the bycatch estimate above, but it does identify the fisheries with the highest number of observed takes. So this graph shows you the number of turtles taken on trips by the top landed species by hail weight. Um, these observed takes we consider underestimates because these are only the interactions documented by fishery observers and federal observer coverage in bottom otter trail gear is generally low. But you can see out of um, the total 274 observed interactions, 95 occurred on croaker trips, 54 on long fin squid trips, and 51 on summer flounder trips. So looking at these combined, um, these three fisheries represent 73% of the trawl bycatch in our region. So as a result, we've been looking at these fisheries in our year research. So next slide. So this is really the same information as I just um, showed you. It just looks at it um, geographically. You can see the different colors representing the different um, species. And then the depth profiles are also on the screen. I just wanted to point out um, that most of the interactions that have been observed occur south of Massachusetts and Georgia's banks. And then most of the turtle interactions have occurred in water shallower than 15 meters. Um, the map in the inset is from the most recent bycatch estimate that I mentioned earlier. Um, I'm just presenting it here so you can have some indication of fishing effort during that time frame. Um, the darker dots, um, if you can see that on the screen, are observed trips, and then the lighter dots are all VTR trips. Um, the hatched area is where TEDs are required in the summer flounder fishery currently, for some context. All right, next, next slide, please. So what are our options to reduce sea turtle bycatch mortality? Um, we have a couple. Um, the first is um, time and area management, like closures. Um, however, the second is really where we've been focusing most of our efforts, and that's on gear and operational modifications. So I'm going to see if you can, um, that's a video, if you could see if you can uh, make that. Yeah, perfect. It's going to go. Awesome. Okay. So this is a sea turtle caught in a trawl net, and it's going to encounter a turtle excluder device, or a TED. So if you're not familiar with it, a TED is a grid of bars or cables that's fitted into the neck of a trawl net, and this is installed in a short cylinder of webbing called a TED extension. So small animals, like fish, can pass through the bars and are caught in the bag end of the trawl. However, when larger animals, like turtles, are captured, they can bump against this grid, and then they escape through an opening in the trawl mesh, and that occurs at either the top or the bottom of the net. So this opening is covered by a flap, which is held closed unless the animal is escaping. So we do have TED requirements in place for the U.S. shrimp and summer flounder trawl fisheries. So this larger escape opening is required in the shrimp fishery, and that allows leatherbacks and these large hard shell turtles to pass through, but that opening is not um, yet required in summer flounder trawls. I also wanted to note that we have had um, workshops in 2007 and 2010, and these workshops occurred with the fishing industry, scientists, and the public. And the point was to discuss bycatch reduction technologies in our fisheries. Um, the discussion and outcome of those workshops really has led our research direction. 
And we do recognize that trials have different configurations, and we've been really working to try to optimize these TEDs for a variety of different fisheries and nets and catch rates. So next slide, if you want to um, move along, I'm going to go over some of the research that we've done on TEDs in different fisheries. So first, I'm going to start with Atlantic croaker. Um, and I'm going to combine weak fish um, for the purposes of this action. Um, we haven't had any observed takes on weak fish trips since 2000, um, but we are considering weak fish with the croaker fishery here because it's our understanding that it's harvested with the same type of trawl gear, same times and same areas, and often by the same vessels. So that's why they're um, included together here. So next slide, please. So now I'm going to go through a series of slides, but I'm going to go through these very quickly. So um, I did want to just note the structure. Um, so the first column is the TEDs being considered. Uh, the next column represents the escape opening of the TED, so that can either be the top or the bottom um, opening or a large or a small sized opening. Then you'll note the study details. Um, we have a column for catch retention by target species. And then the final column is um, other catch, and that can either include other targeted catch or other by catch as um, noted by the captain. Um, I will also note that we have a website, which I'll share a little bit later, and that has the reports on all of this research and more information um, if you want to look at those to get more um, details. And I also want to note that I'm putting this, we already have um, this presentation up on that website, so you can go back through it and look at these tables with a little bit more detail. So very quickly, um, so the flexible flat bar fly net TED is shown here on the screen. Um, this TED has a rigid upper and lower section, and it's joined by a flex flexible center section that acts like a hinge. So this hinge enables the TED to go over the net reel. Um, this TED was tested off of North Carolina, and it found a non-significant 4% loss of croaker. So next slide, please. So another iteration of the TED was developed, and this is really based upon industry input and feedback and a desire for the TED to um, wrap easier around the net reel. So this cable TED has a typical TED design, but it's constructed entirely out of cable, and that allows it to be easily stored on the net reels without damage. So the T1 cable TED is shown here on this, um, in this table, and it was tested with the study details, as you can see here. Um, I wanted to stress that an alternate hull design was used in these studies, but given that the croaker fishery has these large volume catches, it can take a long time to land the fish and then before the next toe is set. So at that time, the school could be broken up and then the density and the size of the school will be different, and that makes this alternate hull study design difficult. So as a result, the sampling nuance did um, create some high catch variability between the toes. And so these results should be interpreted with that caution given the design and then the high volume catch issues unique to the fishery. But I wanted to stress that it is important to note that um, 20 to 30,000 pounds of croaker were landed with the cable TED installed, and those were considered to be high volume catches by the, the researchers. So next slide, please. So the T2 cable TED shown here is basically just an evolution of the T1 TED. It's set at a different angle um, in the net. It's installed differently to maintain a consistent shape in the net, and it's lighter and easier to build. So this T2 tape cable TED was tested recently in Suriname. Um, the target species was snapper, but some croaker, sea trout, and squid were also caught on these trips. Um, if you compare them, this gear to mid-Atlantic fisheries, these vessels do use similar fishing techniques and similar types of trawl nets. The research that was conducted found a 16% loss of the target catch and a 40% reduction of bycatch, which were mostly stingrays. So this is my final slide on the croaker work. Um, I did want to note that we do have some final research on cable TEDs proposed. So we intend to conduct this expanded usability testing in different areas and on different vessels to ensure this cable TED works as anticipated in the fishery. And then we also are proposing TED construction workshops with net shops. So next slide. So now I'm gonna shift gears to summer flounder. Um, as you probably know, um, since the mid 1990s, TEDs have been required in summer flounder trawls, fishing off of North Carolina and Virginia, south of Cape Charles. So any approved hard TED is allowed in this fishery. And the reason why we're looking at it again now is that we recognize that most landings after 2012 have occurred north of Cape Charles with the majority of landings occurring off in New Jersey and New York. So we wanted to revisit this work. Next slide. 
So the flounder TED is an approved TED for this fishery. Um, the small escape opening is what is currently required and it was tested in 2007. So these results, um, which, is re which are represented in the first row, um, found a 35% decrease, decrease in flounder catch, which was a significant difference. It's worth noting that the TED was fished in the area with high skate ray and dogfish bycatch, um, and this resulted in the clogging of the TED. So this clogging has been seen with TEDs, but it was noted by the captain and um, researchers as often temporary in the study. So the second row talks about the uh, large escape opening in the flounder TED. And this result, these, this study found that it increased the catch of summer flounder by 17%. But I did want to note that in that area that was tested, it did have o, low overall um, summer flounder catch rates. So next slide. So the large flounder TED is basically the same as a flounder TED, it's just one third wider. So catch retention testing with this TED found a 13% catch loss of flounder and a 34% reduction of the other catch, which was dominated by skate. So we do recognize that there's been some issues with TED designs and durability in this research. And we have been working on many iterations of TEDs over the years and trying to respond to those issues. So next slide. So as a result of those issues, um, the Northeast Fishery Science Center and industry developed this modified flounder TED grid, which you can see here at the bottom. Um, this TED articulates so it can be rolled onto a net reel and it has a larger grid surface to mitigate potential clocking issues um, with the ultimate goal of improving catch retention. So this modified flounder TED was compared to two different types of TEDs. I recognize there's a lot of um, information on the screen, but very quickly, the first row shows you the results when compared to a flounder TED with a small escape opening. And then the second row shows you the results when compared to a large flounder TED with a large escape opening. So in both studies, there was no significant difference between the TEDs in both the target catch and the uh, non-target catch. So next slide. So I'm gonna quickly mention long fin squid. I recognize that this is not a managed species by the commission, but um, because we are considering this fishery for turtle bycatch reduction measures, I wanted to make you aware of the, of the work that's going on very quickly. So next slide. So I mentioned already the large flounder TED um, in the summer flounder fishery section, um, but this TED was tested for use in the long fin squid fishery as well. Um, this research found a 10% loss of the target catch. So next slide. So given the success of the cable TED in the croaker fishery and then positive industry feedback, this cable TED was tested in the squid fishery as well. So the top opening and bottom opening TEDs were tested and both of those um, years and most of the research found no significant difference in the target catch. I think that's all I wanted to mention on this slide. So you can move to the next one, please. And then the T2 TED, um, it's also in a con consideration in the long fin squid uh, trawl fishery. So this T2 TED has the ability to retain anything, the T1 cable TED, can with a greater degree of catch retention. I'm not gonna go into the details um, on the screen as the results are the same as what was described previously under Croker. But this is my last slide for long fin squid and I did wanna mention that we do have final research proposed with these TEDs as well. So we intend to look at turtle escapement and the bottom opening cable TEDs, um, resize the cable TEDs for use on smaller vessels and evaluate the operational feasibility of the TEDs on multiple size vessels. And through all that work, we want to um, work with the industry and manufacturers on TED installation and handling techniques. So we're essentially trying to get this, um, all of these gears out on more vessels. So next slide. So given the previous industry workshops that I mentioned and discussions with um, industry, NIMS has also been exploring alternatives to TEDs. And this includes limited tow times with data loggers. So now I'm gonna just go over that research quickly, next. So as you might um, recognize, uh, turtle mortality increases with trawl tow duration. However, our incidental capture data suggests that turtles survive tow durations under one hour. 
So looking at limited tow times, it can provide an alternative to TEDs um, in some fisheries and by some individuals that may not choose to use a TED. Um, essentially, these tow duration data loggers are attached to the trawl door and they can measure the amount of time the net is in the water beyond a certain depth. So this alarm timer starts when the door meets a defined depth. So we did test these data loggers on a number of vessels in a wide geographic range. And it was found that the um, data loggers withstood fishing conditions and they reliably recorded tow duration and detected um, tow exceedance. I will note also that um, the timer that started the tow duration started and ended when the doors passed this five meter depth, but that depth is um, able to be um, changed if we should chose to do that. Um, then finally, um, we are proposing um, research to wrap up the data loggers. We want to look at the data loggers with a new technology, which primarily involves Bluetooth. So you're not, um, you do not have to connect to the, the data logger or the materials to get the information. As well, it has the option to collect additional environmental data that might be beneficial to fishing practices. Um, next slide. So we have been looking at all of this research and um, figuring out ways to move forward with management to reduce bycatch mortality. Um, the measures we have under consideration are shown here on the screen. Um, briefly, the first one looks at requiring TEDs with a large escape opening in trawls that target croaker, weak fish, and long fin squid. Uh, the second and third bullets here represent um, changes to the TED requirements in the summer flounder fishery. Um, involving moving the current northern boundary to a point further north, as well as requiring a larger escape opening in those TEDs. And then the fourth one um, is requiring um, limited tow durations, if found to be feasible and, and enforceable in lieu of TEDs. And this will provide more flexibility to the fisheries. So next slide. As I mentioned, though, none of these are set in stone, and we really are interested in getting um, public input and, and some comments. So I'm going to go through, if you want to move to the next slide, on what kind of information is desired. Great, thank you. So this is a series of slides on what kind of information is helpful as we move forward. Um, I did also want to note that this information is included in your briefing materials. Um, but for example, we would like input on whether there are any other measures we should be considering, as well as the appropriate timing and geographic scope of any potential measures. Um, further, it would be beneficial to hear feedback on the applicability of limited tow times in the different fisheries, as well as how to define the fisheries and gear that would be required to use TEDs um, when that time comes. So next slide. And then expanding on um, the operational aspect, we would like to hear some, any feedback on operational issues that you foresee with the use of TEDs. And then also um, whether including weak fish with croaker is appropriate and necessary or whether some other fishing or gear grouping is better. You can move to the next slide, please. And then finally, um, input on economic impacts would be particularly helpful. And this is really information that we need from the industry and your constituents. Um, these questions relate to the individual's input on the choice of management measures, um, being tow time limits or TEDs, the cost and compensation from using gear modifications. So at the time of the rulemaking, um, if we go forward with this, um, we will be considering all economic and environmental impacts associated with the action. So any input received at this time will really help um, us with those later analyses. Next slide. So you may wonder how you can comment. Um, we have a couple different options. So the first one is written comment. Um, we have a dedicated email address um, to, to um, accept public comment. Um, we will be accepting comments until the end of May. And I would really strongly encourage to um, provide written comments this way. And we also have a series of um, virtual webinars that we're conducting. Uh, the dates and times are located are noted on the screen. Um, the information is going to be primarily the same at these webinars. However, we are going to be going into the, the weeds a little bit on certain species at certain times. So um, that's why we have this species specific focus um, on certain dates. And we also have two different call in days where the public can call and provide feedback to NIMS staff uh, verbally. And then 
finally, um, it is our intent and request to um, come back at the May Commission meeting. Um, and at that time, we can provide a summary of what we've heard from the public on this initiative. And then we can accept any additional comments from you, either at the meeting or um, afterwards in, in writing. Um, I noted earlier um, that we have a website, so that's what's noted on the, the screen here. Um, this is really your one-stop shop for all of this information. It has descriptions of the TED designs, it has measures under consideration, information that we would need or request from the public, and then also how to comment and participate um, in the webinars. So I really would um, encourage you to, to reach out to, or to visit that um, website for more information. So in terms of a timeline, and we are a ways out, um, as I mentioned, final research still needs to be conducted and um, worked with the industry, and then we want to consider it by management, and then we have to develop a rulemaking um, package, and this can take quite a while. So I also wanted to note that if we do have any proposed rule, there will be a public comment period at that time, but really now is the time to provide um, early feedback so we can take that into consideration of any measures. or potentially integrate those ideas into future um, gear research. So next slide. I think that is my last slide. Um, I tried to go fast. I know we have a limited amount of time. Um, my contact information is up on the screen and I'm happy to take questions now, but I did also want to stress that there are other opportunities to provide feedback if we don't get to everybody um, today. So thank you. Thanks so much, Carrie. Appreciate the overview of this upcoming work that Noah is doing. Um, and I'm just going to jump right into questions. Dan McKiernan. Yes, thank you, Tony. Um, thank you, Carrie. I'm looking at that plot that showed the intense amount of sea sampling that has been uh, uh, conducted. I'm wondering if you would be able to uh, dive into that data to actually identify uh, tow duration uh, in advance of asking fishermen about whether they would like to limit their tow duration because um, and maybe stratify that analysis by vessel size. You know, there may, there may be a solution that's already there that uh, it, it, it may be beneficial for you to have those answers in advance. Yeah, that's a very good um, thought. Thank you for raising that. We have looked a little bit into the tow duration um, just for summer flounder, but we did not um, divvy that up by vessel size. So I will look into that with our um, stat folks to see if we can to expand on that a little bit more, but thank you. Next up, I have David Borden. Yep, thank you. Uh, Carrie, thank you very much for the presentation, informative. Uh, I was just wondering, are you going to provide a copy of this presentation to the staff so they can distribute it with the PowerPoints from the meeting? Um, I can certainly do that. Um, that, so that, can would, do that. We that, also have it on our website. That website I noted, there's a version of um, this presentation there as well. Yeah, I, I think it'd be helpful to give it to the staff. That way we have all of the presentations. And then the second question relates to the economics for the fisheries that you've looked at this where you've had these uh, units deployed uh, particularly in the mid-atlantic uh, you can't help but reach the conclusion that a significant portion of the of a catch in a trawl is going to be eliminated and it varies by species but ha my, so my question is has has anyone at NOAA looked at that from a economic perspective to see how it might modify the the um, net return from a, a given trip? So at this point, we have just been doing research on the gear and the catch numbers have been included in the study. I mean, we're really at the preliminary right now. And when we get to the point of a proposed rule and, and through this process, we will be looking at the economic impacts. Um, we have not done that yet in terms of assessing a dollar amount, but um, that is something that um, certainly occurs with um, any kind of next step action. So I will I will note that as a, as a certainly. Thank you. Thanks, David. And we'll post her presentation um, when we post all the presentations from the week. Next up, I have Eric Reed. Thank you, Ms. Kearns. Thank you, Carrie. Appreciate the presentation. Um, I just have a question about tow time. Tow time. 
Um, if the sensor goes off at five meters, are, are you talking about O time or time the net is actually in the water? I mean, there's a big difference. Uh, you know, I mean, toe starts when the winches are locked up and, and the gear is working. So, you know, and, and depending on how fast your winches are, how deep the water is, if you started at five meters, I don't know how much time you're going to get on the bottom, which leads me to a comment about lower CPUE. The lower CPUE there is, the more swept area you're going to have to have. So that that's maybe would cause more interaction with turtles because the gear's got to be towed a lot more. So um, mm -hmm. that's my question about tow time. Thank you. Yeah, so the observer data was used to assess turtle mortalities by tow duration. So we want to work with the observer group to ensure we're um, measuring it consistently. Um, it's my understanding that they calculate that tow duration when the net hits the water and then until the hauling equipment is put into gear. Um, so we want to make sure that we're consistent with that. And this five meters was used in the, in the research. However, just for the, um, the depth that the for with the duration began and ended for the alarm timer. Um, but this depth can be variable and it can be whatever we choose. So we really want to get input. Um, this is perfect input that we'd like to, to get from you um, because we do recognize that in some of these deep water fisheries, these um, tow time limits might be a little bit more challenging than in other fisheries. So yeah, I appreciate your comment. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, next on my list, I have Chris Fatsavage. Data value organizer. You're good, Chris. Oh, Emma? Okay, cool. I thought it said it was, but all right. All right. Thank you, uh, Tony. Thank you, Carrie. Um, Carrie, uh, when I think I asked during you, the presentation to the Mid Atlantic Council about you know, maybe looking at um, at this, you know, by, by gear type or configuration, since you know, trawls that target um, uh, croaker and weak fish also target other species. Um, and based based on on that, um, when you look had the the group of other species, uh, you know, and, and that that chart I think on uh, slide six, uh, were were any other ASMFC species uh, listed among those targeted species such as scup or black sea bass that um, that we should be aware of in the event that based on feedback from you know, your um, you know the public hearings that. Uh, NIMS starts looking at this maybe more by a gear, a gear class as opposed to uh, target species where you know, some other species that we manage could be uh, could be uh, part of, of, of these uh, TED requirements. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And that is something that we would like to expand on. I kept the presentation relatively the same from the council. So, you know, we could definitely um, look into the, the appropriateness of of how we phrase some of these fisheries. But to answer your question, out of those 74 um, turtles in that time frame, um, we did know um, the top landed ones were scallop. There's 19 interactions there. Hors horseshoe crab had nine interactions. Um, the combined species of skate had eight, and then scup had eight interactions um, during that time frame. And I can look into that um, in a little bit more detail, but those are the top ones um, in that in that grouping. Thanks, Carrie. I have Emerson Hasbrook and then Jason McMe, and then I think I'm going to cut us off there so we can start Stripe Pass at the um, on time. Uh, thank you, Tony, and thank you, Carrie, for your presentation. Um, I've got several questions, but I see we're short on time, so I'll just ask a couple. Um, one of your earlier slides had a, a table of interactions, turtle interactions with Groker, Summer Flounder long fin squid and other. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think it was the, the, the same slide that Chris was just referring to. Um, could you put that back up, please? Is that possible? Yeah, Tony, it's slide five. I don't know if that helps you. We'll get there. Go on, Emerson, we'll get there eventually. Emerson, I think because of the way the PowerPoint's set up, it's going to take a hot minute. So if you could just ask your question to get us going. Oh, okay. So when we get there, um, so for, for the, the interactions with summer flounder, um, I'm guessing that was relative to the area north of the current TED required area. Is, is that correct? Or did it also include 
um, interactions in, in the TED required area? This included all interactions um, as identified by as summer flounder in any area where the Northeast Fishery um, Observer Program operates. Um, we actually had most of them were north of that line. Um, I did look into this a little bit, and there were um, I think four trips that were identified as top land of summer flounder um, south of that area. Right. One that it was in a different time frame. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then on that same slide, so with longfin squid and summer flounder, there's a total of 105 observed um, interactions there. And I know you said that's a, that's a low estimate, but that's it's 105 over 20 years. So that's about five per year in terms of observed interactions. So that was just, I mean, it's not a comment. I'm not a question. I know it's a comment. Um, and then I had a question on your slide for TEDs in, in the long thin squid fishery using the large flounder TED. I know you said that mm -hmm. the loss was about 10%, um, but I noticed in that slide and it went by pretty quickly that it was a 55% loss initially. Is that right? It, and, yeah. And how does that factor into what you have for loss in the squid fishery? Yeah, thank you. That was a good that was a good catch. I was trying to um, blow through that pretty quickly, so that was my error. Um, just given the audience here, um, the the researchers initially found this fifty five percent loss of squid. Um, so the TED extension attachment was modified um, based upon captain input there, and then after the modification, there was additional. Um, testing, and then we found the 10% loss of the target catch. So that's why there were two numbers on the on the slide there. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and that's encouraging that just by changing the extension of, of you know, um, of where the TED is placed, you're able to, to get a, you know, go from 55% loss to a 10% loss. That's pretty good. Um, and then lastly, in your wrap up, you said that final research needs to be conducted with industry. So um, do you have any specific plans for that, or, or does the Cooperative Research Branch, um, do they have any plans to, to help fund some additional research um, with TEDs in, in the squid and summer flounder fisheries? Yeah, we have um, final research proposed. With COVID, everything is, everybody else in the world has gotten a little bit um, stalled and modified. So we had funds and, um, you know, we had to um, carry them over. So right now we're working at the, with the final um, iterations to getting some of that work up and running. So we do have a small amount of money to um, do some of this work. But yeah, that is that is the intent for the croaker and longfin squid fishery. Um, we have not yet worked with cooperative research, but we would um, you know, definitely love to expand this and, and work with um, individuals as, as money and, and resources will uh, permit. Yeah, thank you, Carrie, and thank you for your presentation again. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, Jason has let me know he is good on his questions, so he's gonna pass. Um, Carrie, I really appreciate you coming in and you and I can touch base over email about our May meeting um, and we'll make sure that the commissioners know where that web page link is. We can share that with them in the weekly mailing. Um, and Great. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Yep. And as a reminder, the webinars that Carrie spoke about are posted on the commission's um, calendar.